once you start to delve into all of the problems of the world and the FBI um, and a feminist conversation, then it's time to include addressing the legacy. The most trans people that had ever been in a scene together on network television was three. And Elizabeth immediately said, well, then we have to have four. <laughs> <laughs> so she constructed a scene where they were having a dinner party just so that we could have more trans people than CBS had done previously. Hi, I'm Ruth Kinane and welcome to Around the Table with Clarice. Today I am joined by showrunner Elizabeth Claviter, actress Jen Richards, and writer Eleanor Jean. Hi ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Almost heaven, West Virginia. You are a woman with a very public reputation Russia. for hunting monsters. I can't have a reputation. I've only done it once. It's time you own that reputation. So we're here to discuss this important upcoming episode of Clarice airing on May 13th titled Silence is Purgatory, um, which addresses the transphobia caused by the original portrayal of Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. Um, I wonder to start, Elizabeth, if you wouldn't mind just kind of setting up what happened after um, Silence of the Lambs came out and the kind of harmful portrayal that that caused to the trans community? I think that Thomas Harrison creating a character, um, a monster with a, a deeper need that would inform his killing actually created a character that did a lot of harm to the community. I think like if we think back to 1993, the transgender community was largely invisible. And there weren't many stories that were being told about the transgender community. And what that did was mean that anything, any portrayal of people who were trans had an, a weight to it and it informed the public's opinion of what it meant to be trans and what it meant to walk through the world. And so when you had somebody like Buffalo Bill, who was portrayed as a monster and somebody who was doing horrific things to women, it reinforced a stereotype that already existed uh, that transgender women were um, people who coveted and wanted to harm women and were part of a misogynistic culture mm -hmm. rather than human beings with um, an authenticity who are moving through their lives with the same desires and needs as any other human being. Um, and can be our neighbors or ourselves or our sisters or our brothers or our family, um, it interrupted that humanity and portrayed monsters. And I think what that did at a time, which is true now, like the transgender community disproportionately suffers from anxiety and depression and a disproportionate number of um, people from that community and their lives and also are disproportionately victims of very violent crimes and uh, murder. So to portray and spread the uh, information that um, these are people who want to harm or are othered and are othered in a horrific way actually would have been some people's first introduction or first thought or would reframe the thoughts that they had, which were potentially not at the forefront of their brain kind of deal. It was harmful, his portrayal. To expand on that context just a little bit, Elizabeth summed it up pretty well, but there had also been ever since Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and a little bit earlier, all the way up through Silence of the Lambs, that was the dominant portrayal of trans women in popular media was the, the cross-dressing psycho killer, uh, you know, in Dress to Kill and Sleepaway Camp and Psycho, like all culminating with the ultimate kind of monstrosity of, of, of Buffalo Bill. So it was kind of referencing other media and building on it and taking it to, to its kind of apex, but because that's all there was, that became the only touchstone for people who didn't know anything about trans people. Right, absolutely. And that was something that you, Jen, discussed in the uh, Netflix documentary Disclosure, right? You were talking about this portrayal and representation of trans people in film and television and specifically Buffalo Bill and kind of that impact. So was what drew you to kind of why was Buffalo Bill one of the examples that like you spoke up about on that documentary? Was there like a personal experience with it or was it just one of the really obvious ones to kind of go with? 
Uh, it, w- it was both. We covered a lot of ground in the documentary Disclosure, which is available on Netflix and covers the entire history of trans representation and, and film and television. And Science of Lambs is a big touchstone because it was such a wildly successful movie in you know, this picture. So it, it has a huge uh, footprint. And then I in particular wanted to talk about it because one of my earliest experiences, uh, I told a colleague of mine that I was about to transition and it was really still kind of scared and tentative and you're not, not quite sure what my new life would look like. And if I would still be able to keep my job and my friendships, when I, I told one of my colleagues that I was thinking of transitioning, she looked at me kind of quizzically and replied, you mean like Buffalo Bill? Like that was like, that was the only thing that came to mind when she heard trans. And that's not exactly that's what you want your friends to expect no. when you're, you're going to transition. Oh my gosh. That's insane. <laughs> Well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That was something that then came up for you on your documentary. Yeah, I mean, I can laugh about it now right? because it seems so silly. And it seems silly to her now, too. Like, it, mm. it's completely absurd. Right. But at that time, particularly in that very fraught early period where you're trying to figure out who you are, and if you don't know any trans people in real life, which most people haven't traditionally, right. all you can look to is media. And it's it's hard not to reflect back to even yourself. Like, God, am I just insane? <laughs> I know I don't want to kill anyone, but like maybe there's something else there. It's it's uh, it's difficult when you don't have any like kind right. of positive role models in the media. Exactly. And then other people's expectations are also informed by that yeah, same media. Totally. When you're not seeing yourself either. Oh my gosh. Um, well then, Elizabeth, you knew on Clarice that you guys were inheriting that kind of transphobic legacy of Buffalo Bill when you were starting talking about making the series, I assume. So was rectifying that portrayal something that like you discussed off the bat and like like how you were going to really kind of fix that that um, view of the character and the trans community? Um, it's definitely conversations that we had. Um, Alex Kurtzman, who created the show with Jenny Lamette, was very aware and um, felt felt that really felt the burden of that legacy as we were beginning talks. So the question was, how do we address this? Where do we address this? When do we address this? And what does that look like? Soon after we began our room, we had set out to make a feminist show about this mm-hmm. young Clarice, this young FBI agent, figuring out how to move through the predominantly male culture of the FBI. We realized that the world had shifted since 1993, that the feminist conversation had to be an intersectional feminist conversation. Once you start to delve into all of the problems of the world and the FBI um, and a feminist conversation, then it's time to include addressing the legacy. So um, it was actually after we'd begun the room that we were like, oh, it's gonna be first season. Like it's gonna be first season and it's gonna be now. And we have to take these conversations very seriously. They're not our stories. So we have to find somebody from from a transgender woman whose story this is, or who's a piece of her legacy this is, Um, that Silence of the Lambs left behind and include those people, um, include someone in the conversation. So I reached out to Nick Adams, who Mm -hmm. I had worked with for many years um, on Grey's Anatomy. He is the director of trans representation at GLAAD. And we began the conversation. He came to the room and we talked about it. I'd like to just say like that journey was really, for me, profoundly moving and eye-opening. It went from something I felt passionately about, but was very theoretical to watching Nick's conversation about this movie and its legacy and watching um, his emotional journey. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but watching his emotional journey with that, I was like, oh, like this is a thing that we really have to dig into and figure out and do it right. Mm -hmm. Um, Which we were always planning on doing, but like it just became visceral, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, So I um, asked Nick if he would put me in touch with Jen and I started collecting writing samples from transgender women who were available to come and tell this story with us. And um, Eleanor's, uh, Eleanor's sample just bowled me over. She's a fantastic writer. Her dialogue is like just so incredible and her characters are wonderful and heartfelt. And I was like, this is, 
this is the woman who has to come and help us with this story. Um, and she was available and Jen was available to come and be a consultant on the entire arc mm -hmm. of um, this character, Julia, and then uh, agreed to play the character, Julia. So um, that that's the story of how we're here today. Awesome. So Eleanor, how did you like, find out this was happening? What did you, so you sent in a writing sample, I'm assuming, and then kind of went from there. How was that whole experience for you? I did, yeah, I didn't really understand um, what it was. I mean, like, as soon as I knew that it was connected to Silence of the Lambs, I was like very fired up um, <laughs> for all the reasons. Um, As the good uh, writing comes from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for all the reasons um, stated by Elizabeth and Jen so well. Um, but it was after, I was a little skeptical to be honest, um, because um, it's it's hard to get these issues right, especially after they've been so ingrained for so many decades and really beyond that. So it was my conversation with Elizabeth um, that really sold me on it. And it was a very, it was very clear that the, the intention and the work behind the intention to set this correctly in a, in a as true as possible way and not as in not a superficial way that's what really sold me on it I was and became very excited not just about Julia as a character but just about the series as a whole and so yeah I was very excited too such to a in. great opportunity but also like a big responsibility I guess did you have did you feel pressure or were you just like no this is gonna be I can do this <laughs> yeah I think there's I mean I think and I think you know Jenna spoke about this several times but I think there's there's just so few of us in the industry, yeah. trans people. Um, and so I think there is just a low to, you know, moderate pressure constantly mm -hmm. um, in what, whether it's, you know, whether, whether I'm in a writer's room, whether I'm, I'm pitching a show, it's like, I, there is an element of like, I mean, nobody wants me to speak for an entire community, but like, regardless, it's like the, you know, when it's something like this, it's like, okay, I kind of have to do that. And even though that's impossible. Um, so yeah, there, there is a little bit of pressure there. Um, but the environment in the writer's room um, that Elizabeth, Alex and Jenny created and, and the entire, uh, I mean, it was just, everyone was so welcoming and, and it was very much a supportive and, and team environment that was, that was, really lifting up my voice in these specific issues, but then also um, coming in and, and, and collaborating as a whole. So yeah, it lessened that pressure for sure. I'm assuming there were a lot of like discussion, just like big conversations about how, what the storyline was gonna be within the show and like how to bring it across, kind of get the point across properly before you even started like putting pen to paper and coming up with the, all the scenes and everything. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I where we really started, which I really appreciated, was just kind of, you know, how did Silence of the Lambs affect me personally? Yeah. And, you know, I had uh, analogous experience to to Jen's, like, that she described. Um, but it was, like, growing up with this movie, um, not only was that, like, everyone else's idea of what a trans person was, was a dangerous person, was a deceiving person, was someone who um, didn't deserve to be in normal society, but, like, those are the message I was receiving, messages I was receiving, too. I grew up in a very conservative part of Texas, and so it was, like, all I had was TV and right. movies to even show me that there were trans people, and so, like, you know, the five a year I saw, you know, three of them were serial killers that like that really can mess with you growing yeah. up like like Jen was alluding to that kind of like am I crazy you know and like that's where I started from with the story in the show because you know I it, it's it's amazing that we were able to kind of build this character to kind of stand in as a proxy for the effects of this movie in real life um and so we just really started with you know the the effects that Silence of the Lambs had on me and people I know um, and that was, you know, really alienating. Um, and when I came out to lots of family and friends, I mean, there was a lot of distrust, you know, there was a lot of feelings of, am I sick? Am I dangerous? You know, I felt those really uh, intensely. And, and those were like, you know, maybe direct effects or indirect effects, you know, from media and, per, and, and um, narratives like that. So I, yeah, I, I very much like, like what Julia says <laughs> in the script, I very much um, feel that. Um, and was happy to be able to um, help tell that story. Julia Lawson, we're with the FBI. Can we talk to you a second? Sir, it's Clary Sterling. Please leave. She's connected to the murder. I got some leverage on our Julia. I am not. You're not what? Gonna do your job? I'm not gonna blackmail someone. Enough! Was there something else? 
the thing you have to say. Is it about me? It's about Buffalo Bill. Totally. Were there a lot of different drafts of that episode? Was it one of those things where you like spent a lot of time getting it just right? I think in different aspects, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there were, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts on the show for sure. And there's like such a great through line throughout the, throughout the show as people are seeing of this massive conspiracy. So that was just always this big moving puzzle. Um, which was so fun to to jump in the middle of and then help like you know hold up a part of it. But the um, the Julia stuff was I you know really give like credit again to the showrunners of like they really I didn't feel over edited or anything at all and I was kind of like okay I'm writing this like big speech Julia goes yeah. and I was like and it's gonna get cut down to one sentence or whatever and it's like that wasn't the case at all. Uh, I'm so I mean, happy because that speech is incredible. I was like, it gave me chills when I was watching it. So very, when you, when she's talking to Clarice, you mean in the office? Yeah. 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 And, they, and they just really gave me that space to write that. And then, and then Jen, you know, brought it to life and, and added to it in such a wonderful collaborative way. And, and yeah, no, it was the, the environment really made it, um, made it all worthwhile. So then Jen, you start, you played Julia after you came on originally as a consultant and then took on the role as well. How was, how was reading that script for the first, or particularly that scene with when she's telling Clarice about the whole Buffalo Bill um, legacy. Um, I was reading that and how I was performing or acting out on that day on set for you. Coming into it, I, I had been in the writer's room enough. Also, Eleanor and, uh, and I worked together on an HBO show called Mrs. Fletcher. So she, yeah. I, I had, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So I had performed her, her lines before and I, I knew her skill for dialogue right. and we had already established a rapport. And then uh, I, I had a chance to be in the room and, and help kind of develop the character. One really nice thing that the show did right from the very beginning was not rely on just one trans person to kind of like speak for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, they had Eleanor, they, they had myself. Um, so that we kind of got to triangulate uh, different kinds of experiences, which is really wonderful. Nonetheless, all of that, all that aside, like when you actually finally get the, the, the actual script and like see this like long monologue on page and like how much emotion is there. And it's like, wow, Eleanor is having to address the entire complicated legacy of Silence and Lambs, like in a trans person's voice, like in this monologue that has to to shift our lead character uh, in an irrevocable way that actually then leads to other storylines too. And, you know, she quotes a line from that speech to uh, Esquivel's character. It informs how she interacts with Ardelia when Ardelia lets her know that she's going to be part of, uh, of the lawsuit. Like, so it, there's a lot on that speech, like not just the trans part. It's, it's really, uh, it, it's incredible. So I was, I was mostly excited. And then of course, then the, uh, the terror sets in and the, the responsibility of like you, you have to find your own way through the words and elevate it and make sure it really lands. And, and there I felt really blessed to be working uh, with Deborah, our director. She wanted that scene uh, to be as authentic as possible. And she worked really hard to kind of create an environment, just like reducing the number of people, like the number of crew members that were actually in that scene so that there could be a little sense of intimacy. Her and I talked it through a long time. Uh, we set up the coverage in a way that I could kind of like build up to the emotions. And then what I think the take that we actually see in the final show what had happened was Deborah had me um, kind of improvise my way through the scene and like add a whole bunch of dialogue and tell a personal story onto it. And then without cutting, just had me then redo the scene as written. And so I had all this kind of like built up this emotion through the improvising and through the previous take and then just went right into a new take. And so came into it with all that feeling. So, which is the, what you finally see on the screen. So that was very, uh, that was just really good directing. I was going to uh, say, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, just a really good team. Yeah. Just a really good team all around. And, you know, Rebecca and I hit it off right away. And, and so I, I felt like I had a good scene partners. It was just all the perfect conditions to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to make Eleanor's words really shine. Um, so then can, can you tease a little bit about Julia's arc? Like this is not, she's not just in this one episode. There can be around for a little while. That's okay. my favorite part of this whole thing too, is I think a lot of other shows would have just like, that would have been yeah. just that one episode, like <laughs> have the trans person come yeah. in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like make her speech, you know, let her be a reason why your main protagonist has some kind of moral growth and then you never yeah. see her again. Yeah. Like that's a typical, uh, a pro, typical yeah. arc, <laughs> yeah. which really is fine. Important to us from the get go mm -hmm. that um, being a transgender woman informed this character. It didn't define her. Right. Um, that she had a big life and that was just a piece of who she is, not her story function. So mm -hmm. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's exactly it. I always say that I I don't want to play cis characters. Like anytime I play a character, I think of that character as trans. I just don't want that character be to re, to be reduced to that singular element. You know, I want to include it, but not be reduced to it. And Elizabeth. Uh, totally understood that from the start and we helped create this whole arc. I think this episode is the last time her being trans actually comes up. I don't know that it actually comes up in the next two episodes. She gets to use her, you know, accounting skills, her moral involvement with this uh, case, which which is hurting women, which is um, when she first decides to help the FBI. It's a very intense conversation between her and her uh, her partner ab- about the, the stakes of her involvement and why it's important to take that risk anyways. So it really puts you Julia in in a larger context where her marginalization as a trans woman informs her character arc, uh, but it just can't be reduced to that. So it's, it's, it's a thrill. One other little spoiler that I'll give. Yes. Because to me, it's just, it's, well, it's just delightful because this is just a, a credit to Elizabeth. I had mentioned that in terms of network television and in terms of the, the, the big, the big networks, you typically only ever saw trans people by themselves. This is also true in, in film as if trans people are always isolated when in fact, every trans person I've known, and you know, going back to the, the 1940s, we're always intensely networked. Trans people know other trans people, and that's a big part of their friend network. And so it's really important to me that Julia not be the only trans person in the show, like that we show her like having a life. And I kind of offhanded mentioned to Elizabeth that previously on CBS, there was a show called Doubt that starred Laverne Cox. And there was one scene where, you know, she's hanging out and having lunch with two of her girlfriends, which was played by Angelica Ross and myself. And so that the most trans people that had ever been in a scene together on network television was three. And Elizabeth immediately said, well, then we have to have four. (laughs) So she constructed a scene where they were having a dinner party just so that we could have more trans people than CBS had done previously. (laughs) Yeah. Breaking ground. I love it. (laughs) Even the small things. That's great. That's so awesome. Yeah. But those, those, of the little small things that really make a difference. You know, I I recently talked to um, a a sociologist about trans representation and something that she said that really struck me was you're never going to change someone's mind, like through like a direct speech, through like a direct effort to change someone's mind. It's the wallpaper that changes minds, like what's in the background and just taken as a given. The background of traditional trans representation is that, that trans people are isolated, that they are kind of solitary and that they're tragic. The background wallpaper of this show is that Julia's, you know, um, successful in her career, that she is in a happy relationship, that she has a vibrant friend network, that she's very connected. Like that's not her main story, but it's the background of her story. And that will be then just taken as a given for people who watch the show. So the most revolutionary part of this betrayal is actually the kind of subtle background of it. I'm just afraid that you're going to start talking to the FBI and throw away your job. I didn't say that. I... I just said that the stuff I found was weird. But why? How does it concern you? It concerns me because they told us that women died, Erin. Am I supposed to unhear that? Am I supposed to unfind what I found? I'm sick. And uninsurable. And we have insurance. And we have a house, and those things are dependent on your job. If we lose it all. (sighs) Now I sound like a selfish bitch who doesn't care about anyone but herself. No, honey. No. I know. People like us don't get those things. Look at our friends. I haven't decided that I'll do it yet. Yes, you have. Just promise me this. Tell Starling what she did. Tell her. Make sure she knows. You want to stand up for other people? Start by standing up for yourself. So important. That's so cool. I hadn't even thought about all of that. That's really awesome. I guess going forward for all of you in your careers, this is going to be something you continue to kind of dismantle this, not just Buffalo Bill, but what we've talked about, this kind of negative portrayal or psycho or whatever it is portrayal of trans people is that something you're going to continue i mean elizabeth on the show will that come back in any way or is this something 
Will Julia be back, Elizabeth? I'd love yeah. to know. <laughs> well, we have made it clear that accountants are very valuable at the FBI, and she there does get that bill. The, the joke on set was always that I'll be back next season when all the characters need to do their taxes. Right. It'll be a riveting, <laughs> riveting episode. Hey, that's an annual occurrence. You're good. You're yeah. good. Ten seasons later, you'll be like, <laughs> but is that something that you hope that you'll be able to continue just to shine light on, I guess, and any other projects that you're, any of you are working on? Um, I, I mean, I, I strive for inclusion of all sorts and I love telling the stories of people and authentically and in collaboration with people whose stories there are. So, I mean, this has been a fantastic experience for me and um, definitely something I'm interested in. There's a lot of there's a lot of story. There's a lot of um, presence. There's a lot of collaboration to be had. So I think, I mean, we're still waiting on our season two pickup, but I wouldn't, I think for all of the writers in the writer's room, this has definitely been something that we have taken very seriously, but also for the cis writers, like gotten a lot out of. I think we've all learned a tremendous amount and um, want it to be a better world and want to be part of that. Like, and it seems like telling good story is an incredible way to be part of that. So I would, I would not be surprised. And it must be so rewarding as well to like, for you guys to see this kind of complete circle where, you know, somebody said to you years ago, Jen, if I, oh, like Buffalo Bill, and now you get to like educate people in a way. And also just like any other young people, trans people get to see that and feel better and like feel represented in a way. So it must be like, it's, a kind of, you know, it's deep. Yeah. It's profoundly satisfying and, and, and a little bit surreal. I, I sometimes yeah. feel like I, I argued my way into a career, <laughs> 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 you know, just through, through lots of public conversations about casting and then inclusion and uh, in this case, very specifically about Science of Lambs and it actually resulted in, in work for myself. But most of the work that I've done behind the scenes in terms of advocacy work has been for the next generation. There's always this kind of sense like you, you fight to make things better so that the people behind you can take it for granted. And so I'm kind of shocked and delighted every time that it, it directly benefits me as well. You know, when I came in to this as a consultant, there was no plan for me to perform the part. I always imagined that it would be, you know, a, a younger, prettier trans girl. I mean, this is Hollywood. And I I accept that. <laughs> and, and when they offered it to me, I was just um, really humbled and, and really grateful. And anytime I get to, to be back on screen, it's, 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 it's a form of play and it's just really delightful. And particularly with this casting crew who I just cannot speak highly enough about. Love, love to hear that. Um, I know we're like, this, this is progress, obviously, but how do you all feel about trans representation on film and TV today compared to where we've been? It's obviously better, but what do you think are kind of the next steps to keep pushing this forward? I would say story where, to what John was saying earlier, where the characters are informed by their transgenderness, are informed by being transgender, but are not defined right. by it in their stories. And where we're building communities and like the wallpaper is community, right? The wallpaper is, you know, big lives, big stories, um, coexisting and having conflict that is not rooted in our gender. That would also be nice for the world, for storytelling and also the world. Totally. Absolutely. Um, well, guys, this has been so informative and delightful, and I cannot thank you enough for your time. I can't wait for everybody to see the episode. It's truly so great. And I can't wait to see the next again episode and everything else that's to come this season on Clarice. So thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. Yeah, of course. This has been Entertainment Weekly's Around the Table with Clarice. And check out the episode when it airs on CBS on May 13th.